Welcome to the Long Thread Podcast about spinning, stitching, and weaving by hand. The podcast is presented by Long Thread Media, publishers of Spinoff, Handwoven, Piecework, and Little Looms magazines. Find us online at longthreadmedia.com. Trainway Silks is where weavers, spinners, knitters, and stitchers find the silk they love. Select from the largest variety of silk spinning fibers, silk yarn, and silk threads and ribbons at trainwaysilks.com. You'll discover a rainbow of colors thoughtfully hand-dyed in Colorado. Love natural? Trainway's array of wild silks provide choices beyond white. If you love silk, you'll love Trainway Silks, where superior quality and customer service are guaranteed. Knitpicks.com has been serving the knitting community for over 20 years and believes knitting is for everyone, which is why they work hard to make knitting accessible, affordable, and approachable. Knitpicks responsibly sources its fiber to create an extensive selection of affordable yarns like High Desert from Shanika Wool Company. Are you looking for an ethical, eco-friendly yarn to try? Look no further than Knitpicks Eco Yarn Line. Need needles? Knitpicks makes a selection for knitters right at their Vancouver, Washington headquarters. Knitpicks.com, a place for every knitter. I'm your host, Longthread Media co-founder Ann Marrow. Elena Kanegi Lauks is a historian, maker, and teacher of traditional handmade lace. A PhD student at the Bard Graduate Center, she is one of the founders of the Brooklyn Lace Guild. Elena, thank you so much for being with me. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and to speak to you. I was thinking about how to describe what you do, and the, the best I can do is to describe you as a lace maker. Would you say that that's kind of what you what you do? Yeah, absolutely. I describe myself, I think, as a lace maker and as a historian because I think they, they together, they're equally important in the work that I do. And they are kind of one and the same for me, but sort of in the work that I do, they can be a little distinct, whether I'm working in academia or as a maker, but they all come from the same interest and love of lace. You know, historically, there were so many different kinds of lace and, and so many of them were sort of regional. And I was curious, are you interested in all of them generally, or do you have a particular specialty? Well, my specialty as a maker is bobbin lace, because that is just the technique that really, when I first tried it, which was actually in Idria, Slovenia in 2012, I just immediately, it like clicked in my brain. It itched a spot in my brain or scratched, I should say. And I was like, oh, this is for me. So as far as a technique, as far as a process, I love to make bobbin lace, although I make all kinds of different textiles and, and other kinds of lace too. But as far as the history goes, I'm really broadly interested in everything. And in fact, in many cases, historically, a lot of these like regional to variations have not been like examined as a whole or not everything gets included under the same umbrella. There's traditional definitions of lace that only kind of look at particularly Western European needle and bobbin lace. And I'm much more interested in lace as part of like a global network, a global tradition and family of techniques that is made in all different regional varieties. Because the more you look at these different areas, you're like, wait, but that's just like this. Chinese needle looping from the 14th century is so similar to Venetian needle lace structures in the 17th and 16th century. So of course, they evolve very differently. But uh, to me, there's a lot of relationship between these things. And I think that at least among sort of the makers and, and folks that I know that we do tend to think about Alonson lace and Bruges lace and, and having an awareness of those non-Western traditions. It just seems like we're just kind of not aware of all of these different ways that people were making fancy things. Absolutely. And the way that these things either developed organically in different regions of the world, like different techniques in ancient Peru, where they were making gauzes, embroidered gauzes in the Shanke civilization way back in the 10th century and things like that, that are very lace-like and figural in their, but they're made in different techniques. But then we also have so many different parts, even within Europe, that people don't necessarily recognize these kind of techniques and know them. For example, like in Slovakian, like polychrome free laces where they make lots of square tallies and they sort of make these pixelated designs that are just fabulous. And for me, like the joy of lace is that, you know, it's been 12 years and I still feel like I've just scratched the surface and there's so much more to learn. So I really love, of course, I've had the pleasure of visiting Alençon 
and Bruges, and I've studied there, and they are spectacular. And there's a reason that they are beloved lace regions, but there's so many. There's so many more around the world that I hope to bring attention to through my work. You know, I think that's interesting. How would you define lace? You said that this is kind of lace-like. What would you say is lace? Well, my working definition is that lace is a textile in which the pattern is defined by the spaces between the threads or filaments, I should say. Meaning that, you know, it's not just like fabric with holes cut out per se, but it's actually a structure that is built up of some sort of thread or filament to create an open work structure. So this can be woven, this can be knotted, this can be interlaced, this can be knit, this can be looped. Like there's, the further you get into it, the harder it becomes to sort of like draw these lines between categories. So actually, I often go back to Irene Emery's primary structure of fabrics when I think about these things. If, if anyone is, has heard of that, it's a very, very nerdy, super technical book on like knitting is a single element structure and bobbin lace is a multi-element structure and a set of elements and things like that. It's like super, super technical, which isn't the way that I approach teaching lace, but because it would be totally overwhelming, I think, some, to approach it that way. But when I think about trying to define it, it's really this network, frankly. Is there a universal kind of association between things that have these spaces and a more formal or embellished kind of textile? Like, is lace always fancier? That's a great question. I mean, I think arguably, yes, because it's not practical or utilitarian in the way that, for example, like non non-lace knits can be very warm and practical for, you know, fisherman sweaters or protecting you from the elements. But lace, what I love about lace, generally speaking in this broad category, is that it is beauty's, beauty for beauty's sake. It is really about the decorative. It developed many of these different techniques I've described, including macrame, which developed from knotting woven thread warp fringes, and bobbin lace, which developed from braids, decorative braids, and needle lace, which developed from decorative buttonhole stitches on on your linens. You know, all of these developed as ways to make your textiles more beautiful and then became an independent textile that is very hard to wash and take care of. So they're not practical. They are really there to be decorative and beautiful objects. And and to me, there's something about that purity of the essence of, of why they exist that I find so wonderful. Like human beings, just we can't resist making things as beautiful as we can. I wonder if that's connected to the way that industrial, you know, machine making has kind of taken over a lot of lace making so that when people think about lace, they don't think about somebody making it by hand. I mean, when I say people, I don't mean textile nerds. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> of course. If, you, if you go to a dressmaker or something like that and you look at lace, there's no assumption that this is handmade. Absolutely. And it, and it wouldn't be. And in fact, unless you go back to the early 19th century and before, most of it is machine made. But yes, that's a, that is a great point. And actually, one of the questions I get a lot from people outside the textile world is, you know, why? Why bother making lace by hand when you can get it from a machine? But I think there's a fundamental worldview difference in that question that is hard for me to explain to people that are not makers, which is that I make lace by hand because the pleasure of making it is the joy. It's the process. And something that's machine made, of course, I wear machine made lace and I have lots of it. And I, I don't, some people think maybe I look down at it or something. Not at all. But it's just a different thing. It's a different category of object for me than something that is purely handmade because of the human essence that the fact that a person made it. I mean, when I finish some of my major commission projects, in particular a piece for the Bard Graduate Center exhibition Threads of Power in 2022, I remember after like, I think it was like 260 hours in or something like that or more that I finally was able to, no, maybe it was like 160 anyway. I was finally able to turn back the first segment of my lace and look at it from the front because in bobbin lace, you often work on the back. So you don't see what it looks like from the front until you're finished, which is 
kind of crazy. <laughs> it's kind of scary. <laughs> yeah. So you you just cross your fingers and you hope that there isn't a mistake you missed. But again, that's part of being a human made object. But when I turned it back, I just I wept with pride. I mean, this overwhelming feeling that, oh my God, I made this and it was so hard. And I was really frustrated sometimes. And I poured my heart and soul into this and blood, sweat, and tears quite literally. That experience, that moment, I mean, I I could just never see having that experience with machine made lace. Maybe if I designed it and I set up the machine and because that's another kind of misconception that people have, that machines are sort of these like autonomous in human objects that just spit out textiles for us, which is a total misunderstanding. And in fact, many lace machines and manufacturers have gone out of business, particularly like the Jacquard woven weavers laces, because they're because it takes seven years to apprentice apprentice just to operate a machine. I mean, they they don't even even the wealthiest companies and couture houses have trouble getting high end machine laces now. So I think it's just it's a fundamental world worldview difference. And I totally understand why, because we live in this world where, you know, when people suggest to me like, oh, well, AI is going to replace hand lace making, but it never can because (laughs) the whole point of making lace by hand is that I'm making it by hand, you know, we, and we love doing it. I clearly, I could go on and on, but I will just say that I listened to Justin Squizero's interview on this podcast. And I think he said something like, it's all process and the rest is gravy. And that is how I feel about lace making too. Like, of course, I love the finished object and I'm proud of it. Boy, the process is really what I love and what what keeps me doing it for years. And now a word from our sponsors. Knitters know Mano Still Uruguay for their yarn's rich tonal colors, but the story of women's empowerment and community benefit enriches every skein. Discover 17 bases from lace weight to super bulky, made and dyed at artisan-owned cooperatives in Uruguay. Ask for Manos at your local retailer or visit fairmountfibers.com. Creating consciously crafted fibers and patterns is more than just a focus for Blue Sky Fibers. It's their passion. Ever since they started with a small herd of alpacas in a Minnesota backyard, they've been committed to making yarn in the best way possible to show off its natural beauty. While their exclusive offerings have grown beyond alpaca to include wool, organic cotton, and silk, their desire for exciting makers about natural fibers hasn't changed one bit. It all winds back to the yarn, ensuring that every precious handmade hank is lovingly filled with endless inspiration. BlueSkyFibers.com. And now back to the show. Well, one of the things that's different between a handmaker and a machine-made item is that, yes, it, it does require a skilled person to do it. But once you get the machine set up, there's an incentive to reproduce, to make the same thing again. And as a handmaker, you can choose to make the same thing. You can try to make the same thing if you want to. <laughs> but you can also choose to do things that are different every time. Well, and for me, the, the fundamental difference between handmade lace and machine-made lace, particularly when I'm thinking about bobbin lace and the machines that imitate bobbin lace, like the Lever's Lace Machine, is that bobbin lace is totally you have ultimate freedom. Your threads can go anywhere because you, the human, are making the choices about where everything goes. So as long as you have the skill and the knowledge to execute patterns, which does take time and investment, which is all the more reason why it is such a joy to do, you can make any any shape. You can draw something and make any shape in, that you can imagine. But a machine is still limited to the warp and weft. The Lever's lace machines, the Jacquard lace machines, they make absolutely exquisite patterns. But again, they are yardage of fabric and they're doing repetition. So they can't make something to shape or something three-dimensional or something polychrome the way that a human being can. So that's why a lot of lace makers refer to bobbin lace as kind of like off-loom weaving, because essentially every thread has the potential to be a warp or weft if you're a weaver. And I was a weaver first. I learned to weave when I was 18 and I wove for many years before I got really focused on bobbin lace. So I think that's why it appeals to my brain, because I have a weaver type brain. (laughs) It reminds me of something I often say about crochet and crochet and knitting, is that some people find one more easier, more difficult than the other, because in knitting, at the end of the row, unless you've done something, you probably have the same number of stitches. And in crochet, the freeing thing is you can put the hook anywhere. And the challenging thing is you could put the hook, you could put the hook anywhere. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Bottom yeah, lace is essentially suspended when you're working on it. It's just held there 
with temporary structures. Exactly. And, you know, depending on the technique you're using in bobbin lace, you can be working in a continuous strip where you just use the same number of bobbins the whole time. Or you can work on part laces where you're actually making motifs that are later assembled. Or you can work in the sort of more Eastern European and Russian style of tape laces where it's like you have very few bobbins, but you're using a sort of tape undulating tape to make these sort of labyrinthian shapes so that you can make something really big and elaborate with very few threads. So there's a lot of different options. But I will say that I actually learned to crochet from my mom very young. So crocheted lace was like my first real lace. And uh, I have tried and repeatedly taken knitting classes and I get it and I can do it, but it just hasn't stuck. And I feel like there's something to that too, that it's just like whatever you learn first kind of sticks with you in your brain. So I, the way that I knit is the way that I crochet. I hold the yarn the same way. And I, and I want to grab the yarn and st- like, like I'm hooking it. And I tat the same way too. My hands are in the same. They're just, that's what they want to do. <laughs> it's so funny how that happens. Yeah. Do you find that there are differences between the laces besides technique? You know, you mentioned that there are sort of regional variations. I guess some people are more tra- drawn to tatting or needle lace. What is the sort of landscape of these laces? That's a good question. I mean, there's the incredible thing about lace is that there's kind of endless variety to what you can do with it. And so there are, even within these categories of technical categories, there are so many regional varieties. Crocheted lace is one that emerged relatively late around the time of the Irish famine that was really coincided with this innovation of Irish women and girls in this period of desperation and poverty. And they were looking at Venetian needle laces from like the 17th century and and imitating them in this three-dimensional form using crochet, which the hook and the technique had existed, but not in the sort of lace form prior to this. This is like the 1840s. And then crochet lace, lace became wildly popular and it spread around. And now there's different techniques in different regions that vary dependent on like how they are used to making lace. So like in Orvieto in Italy, their crocheted lace is made on like a a pattern, like on a paper base. They actually like couch threads down and crochet in between it because they're a needle lace country. So they, you know, they have this long history of making needle lace and that's how they make needle lace. So that's how they crochet. And then, so those are just a few variations, but in um, Tenerife lace too, which is a needle lace worked in the round, it developed from like Spanish cut work and drawn work used in ecclesiastical settings like in the 16th century and it became this detached and totally independent thing particularly in the Spanish Americas or in the Americas in general and it's made in three different ways so like in Puerto Rico they call it soul lace like the sun because it's like a little wheel with spokes like the sun rays of the sun and they make it on a pillow because they they're a bobbin lace country and they work on a pillow so you know it makes sense and then or a bobbin lace region i should say but then the in Paraguay, where it's called nyanduti, which is the Guarani word for spider web, they make it on a f- stretcher frame, which is more akin to like embroidery, etc. So like there's even within these, and they have different patterns and colors, and and they have different meanings, and the tools vary, and it's I'm always finding as to, whenever I think that I've exhausted like new lace techniques, I always find something new. So <laughs> it's really. Endless, endless rabbit hole of joy. <laughs> you know, and I've been sort of assuming because I, you know, look at your, look at your Instagram and your webpage that there's a knowledge of what bobbin lace is, but maybe I should ask you to d- sort of describe how bobbin lace works, what it looks like. Yeah, absolutely. Bobbin lace is, it's like a little, a little forest of pins on a pillow, but essentially is what it looks like. But essentially, it was it developed out of elaborate braiding techniques if you think of like passementry braids the type that are used on like military braids on um, military uniform trims gold trims or like really elaborate victorian couch braid trims around the borders like that's the passementry category and it's today it's a separate category but when passementry and bobbin lace were in their earliest stages say in like the early 16th century around northern Italy, they were just very simple four-strand, eight-strand, six-strand braids. And as these braids became more elaborate and they were using more and more threads, often metal and silk colorful threads that were applied as like surface ornament, it became really thread management. It's hard to keep track of all these loose threads that are hanging out. So eventually, 
the technique was innovated into bobbin lace where you are working on a pillow base, which is not a soft couch cushion, but a very firm pillow in all different shapes, depending again on your region and technique that are stuffed really densely with kind of whatever you have. So like horse hair, moss, straw, and you just make it as solid as possible so that it can hold your pins firmly upright. And then you can, early laces were worked freehand, so they didn't have a pattern underneath. But as they became more complicated, they, you lace makers started working with patterns or pricking cards, which are basically just a parchment or cardstock that has the pattern drawn on it and like pinholes placed where you're going to put your pins. So you can pin that to your cushion, your, your lace cushion, and then you hang the pairs of threads wound around bobbins on the pins. And then you're just crossing and twisting them in patterns to fall like in to follow the diagram below. I hope that makes some sense. It's it's much clearer when you look at it. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> it's less complicated than it sounds, believe it or not. <laughs> well, and and you, when you watch a video of it, people are moving those bobbins around so quickly. It's kind of hard to to know how to, how you keep track. How do you know what you do next? Yeah, I always compare it to like playing the piano because it really is similar. My mom was a classical pianist and taught us and had aspirations for my sister and I to play the piano and I was never very good at it. However, I studied it enough to know that it's similar and that like when you start, you want to label every key and so you know what they are and then you can select them really carefully. And then maybe you start to learn to read music so you can put that in front of you and look at the notes and you and you understand like what you're doing. And then eventually you get to the point where you don't you can just kind of freely innovate and write your own music and you can close your eyes and your hands will just play songs for you. So that's kind of how bobbin lace making is. It it takes time, but I am not to the level of the lovely older ladies you see on Instagram whose bobbins are flying. I do not work that fast yet, but they have like usually four or five decades or more on me. So I'll get there someday. It's (laughs) uh, goals. (laughs) Absolutely. And the thing about music though, is that there is a certain the notation tells you what order to do things in. It's left to right. That's how you convey time. So when you look at a bob and lace design and there's these little dots, how do you know what to do next? That's a really good question. There is a color coding diagram system similar to crochet diagrams that was introduced in Belgium around 1912. So pretty recent, actually, that you can now, when you buy new bob and lace pattern books or 20th century and 21st century ones, at least. There are detailed vis- like visual instructions for you as the lace maker to be able to read and interpret like each stitch. So, you, so the thread, the lines literally represent the paths of your pairs of threads. So if you can read how what the colors mean, you know what stitch to do on that segment, basically. It'll tell you. But historically, that was not the case. And bobbin lace makers had to be essentially engineers. And I make this argument a lot, and I this is something that I study in my own research, is that for good reason, a lot of historians are very interested in pattern books, lace pattern books of the Renaissance as evidence of this, you know, growing technique and industry. But if you compare, for example, the early bobbin lace pattern books to what was actually being made, the lace makers were already working at a very high level and making much more elaborate things than could be published because it's difficult to illustrate some of these things. And at a certain point, if you're working at a very high level with really elaborate patterns, you just have to have that knowledge in your own head. So the designers, in many cases, were really just illustrators, and they were creating beautiful designs for the lace makers to work on, but they weren't conveying the technical information at all. The technical invasion information lived in the lace makers heads. And they had to, through many years of apprenticeship and experience, learn how to translate what they were looking at into actual stitches. So just to say, it is very advanced. <laughs> <laughs> that is very advanced, but you don't, we don't have to do that anymore. We have a much easier color-coded system, so it's much easier to dip your toe in <laughs> as a beginner. Because the pins that hold it open, you have to know how, when you take them apart, for those structures to not just collapse. Well, what's nice is that lace is a very, very solid structure, actually. And because it's like a 
foundationally a braided and kind of woven structure. If you imagine when you cut fabric off a loom, it doesn't just fall apart. So it's, I've always, my students, when they unpin their first sample, which is just like a kind of a bookmark strip where you're practicing different stitches, they get so nervous because they're like, it's going to fall apart. And I'm like, no, literally the only way it would fall apart is if you went back and undid all of your stitches and <laughs> that would take hours. So you're it's like, don't worry. It really is very stable. And lace makers were particularly like in the 18th century working in Flanders, were working with incredibly fine threads, like finer linen than a human hair strand. And so they would even be braiding the ground. So they're actually really tight. These grounds that look like these super fine mes- meshes, they're using like four threads in one tiny area and those are plied. So it's like, it's wildly fine, but it's actually quite dense. And in fact, one of my instructors in Belgium once said that, oh, Valenciennes lace, which is a very fine Flemish lace that sort of peaked in the in technical complexity in the 18th century, she said, oh, Valenciennes lace, that's like, you could beat it over a rock and it would be fine. It's so sturdy. <laughs> and it doesn't seem like that, but actually it's so dense that it really holds its structure well. As far as laundering, you have to block things just like with knits and things like that if you don't want it to collapse and have and lose that tensioning. So there is that. Again, the, the care and maintenance is another th- is a whole <laughs> issue, but I just try to avoid needing to wash things, I think. Yes, which is traditional, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it seems like our sort of machine-made lace goes along with our machine-done washing. <laughs> so. Right, and my husband hears me rant about this all the time, but I just, I, I, other than for large-scale things that you know need industrial washing, I'm, I'm like, I just don't, I don't trust washing machines. I think they're too harsh on our, on our clothes, and. They don't really get things very clean. I'm much more of a believer in hand washing. So <laughs> because you can be like more focused and more delicate at the same time. So but who has time to hand wash everything? I don't. So I understand. Machines, thank gosh for washing machines. <laughs> yes, in their in their place. And one of the things is that, you know, you mentioned that your students initially make a bookmark, which is sort of rectangular. It's all sort of right angles in terms of the sides. But some of the pieces that I've seen you do, for example, you have a collar where the entire structure of the collar, like a shirt collar, in the, the form of a shirt collar, the entire structure of it is in is in lace. So you're laying right. out a structure that you're building around corners. Right. Yeah. So basically the the first pattern that students will often do in bobbin lace is a stitch sampler. It's the same thing as knitting your first scarf in a beginning knitting class and you start with stocking at and then you learn how to knit purl and then maybe you add you do some ribbing and then maybe you do a little some put some holes in it or you do a little cabling things like that and then at the end you have this very wonky long I have several of these long (laughs) scarves (laughs) with like all different sections of different techniques so that's exactly what I do with beginners and what many, many bobbin lace teachers start this way. So you're really just learning the stitches and not yet how to combine them into a pattern, if that makes sense. And then after a few samplers learning different stitches and different ground and filling stitches, which are used to make motifs and backgrounds. And there's an endless variety dependent on what region of lace you make. And in fact, the amazing computer scientist, Veronica Irvine, who has a PhD and is a lace maker in computing and the lace algorithm, she actually, for her dissertation project, created an algorithm to prove that an endless number of lace grounds are possible. So really, there are an endless variety. But when it's basically, you start with learning smaller individual skills, and then as building blocks, like you get the individual pieces. And then when you want to create a pattern with all of those, be it simple edging or a collar or something much larger and more elaborate, you're putting those all together in that pattern. So you can really make anything in bobbin lace. You can you can design anything. You just have to have those building blocks first. And you mentioned what your students do, and you spent a lot of the last month teaching bobbin lace in a variety of places. So you're actually making more bobbin lacers everywhere you go. Yeah, I had a really amazing summer of lace making. I both took bobbin lace classes at the in Vadstena in Sweden at their annual lace festival 
And that was an incredible experience. So it was it was such a joy to be a student again with my instructor, Jeanette Aston, who ha- has been a resident of Sweden for 50 years, but is actually from Texas. So of course, it was a bonus to have an English speaking teacher, although I really enjoyed listening to Swedish as well. So they gave me like a deep dive into the different regional variations, because even within Sweden, there's like three major lace regions that have totally different types of lace that they make on different tools, different styles and methods. And then I taught three different workshops in August. It was a bit of a whirlwind, but a wonderful one. And this is something that I really love to do is to travel to different parts of the US and teach intensive workshops in person at different folk schools like the Peters Valley folk school or craft school and the John C. Campbell folk school and also at Marshfield School of Weaving in Vermont, which was their first bobbin bobbin lace class. So it was it was really a privilege to do that. And yeah. So look forward for more in 2025. I think my class at the John C. Campbell Folk School is up for May, but there there will be others later in the year. (laughs) Now of course I have this thing where once you discover something you feel like Everyone is just discovering it for the first time, but it really does seem like there's a bit of a, a resurgence or a little bit more awareness of, of bobbin lace, So such that you had three places to teach bobbin lace just in the month of August. Do you see that happening? Is that something that you're seeing out in the world? Absolutely. One of the things that I think a lot of textile people hear, but especially I think as a lace person, when I talk about that, people say, oh, lace making, isn't that a lost art? Or isn't that a dying art or something like that? And I say, no, it is a flourishing art. It is thriving. We are having a renaissance around the world. And honestly, a big part of that, just like with other textile techniques, there was a big boom during lockdown. And when people were at home in the early months of the pandemic and feeling disconnected from one another. And the lace world, as you can imagine, it has not necessarily been the first to jump online and and connect virtually, but everyone took to the challenge incredibly. And there's so many great virtual courses and opportunities and so much like knowledge sharing that was happening. And so this allowed all of these younger people who had been interested in learning to make lace but couldn't find anyone in their own region. And a lot of the lace classes might be advertised at a bulletin board, but then you have people looking for classes online and not finding them. You know, so they this sort of the gap was bridged and this allowed for this huge boom. So I've taught online plenty of times. I was teaching through the Textile Arts Center for a while. At the moment, I only teach during the summer because I am a full-time PhD student during the academic year, so I don't have time, I'm afraid. But there's so much more opportunity to learn. And even I've had students that have turned around and started teaching. So it's, it's a really exciting moment. There's a lot happening. And I see more and more people getting hooked on this technique. And it just, it gives me great joy. You know, I remember I had a history teacher talking about early, about colonial American home building and who said that at that time, materials were expensive and labor was cheap. And now it's the opposite. At this point, paying someone to acquire the skills and then make the lace is the part that is, you know, the big investment. Right. Absolutely. And I mean, I will say that that is true within the U.S. context. Mm -hmm. Our labor is not cheap, but we certainly have cheap labor in the global south, in the garment industry. And so it, it is, it is complicated. We basically just outsourced that, that cheap labor. So you still can get, you can go to fast fashion websites and buy things that were hand crocheted and wonder, gosh, like who really did this? It's kind of unbelievable. But yeah, I mean, certainly there's not a desire to, there's not a willingness or understanding of why people should be paid for this work anymore because we're not confronted with this, these processes. We don't, people aren't familiar with the labor intensity that goes into producing textiles, even when they are machine made. I mean, one of the things I always tell my students is that every loom on earth, to my knowledge, has been threaded by hand. It doesn't matter if it's industrial production. Anything you're wearing that's woven, even if it's fast fashion, even, you know, from anywhere that still a human being is involved in that process. And so, but something that stands out to me in history is that like now antique laces are at a, as far as like financial value are, are really not going for high prices anymore. And so it's astronomically more expensive to pay someone in the U S or 
to make something by hand. But like in the Victorian period, when historical laces were unbelievably popular and fashionable, they there was a huge trend for particularly these sort of like robber barons' wives, like the Vanderbilts and the Parsons and all the, the Gilded Age kind of families. All these women were collecting historic lace. And at the time, there were all of these revival industries of handmade lace production because there were lots of people already saying we have to protect this from disappearing. So you could buy reproductions, even made in the US, of like stunning historical laces to a very high degree. And the quality in many cases was like indistinguishable from the historical lace. But yet it was it cost far less than buying the historic versions that were several hundred years old because people wanted the quote real thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So it is, it's value is something that I think a lot about as a lace historian. How do we assign value, financial value, emotional value, meaning all of this community heritage value. And so it's, it's something that I, I really, I think about a lot and I hope that things will change. And I hope that people will learn once again and begin to see these handmade things in their universe and understand the labor that goes into them. I think that there is such an expectation that textiles, you know, you you pointed out that all of them are to some extent made by hand, but that that they're all largely mechanized, that people don't realize that everything crocheted beyond basic slip stitch has to be made by hand. There is no machine that knows how to crochet. Exactly. And this is true depending on how technical you get to some extent with with other textiles as well, because machines, the purpose of machine industrialization is to get things that are faster and more affordable. And in many ways, that's excellent because it makes clothing more accessible to more people. So there's definitely pros to this, but there's always going to be shortcuts when you're trying to make things faster. So so you're never going to get exactly the same thing as something made by hand. But clearly, I am biased here <laughs> in what I value, in my value systems. So mm -hmm. I will always prefer the handmade if I can. But it doesn't mean that I denigrate the machine made either. Speaking of materials, I think there's also, when, you, when you're doing bobbin lace on your own, I'm assuming that you, that you tend to choose nice materials because they're going to be running through your hands. And that's not necessarily something that we see with larger scale production of lace. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of times I hear like, oh, I don't like lace. It's so scratchy. And I'm like, no, no, your problem is that it's polyester. Your problem is that it's a, it's a synthetic fiber, fiber that's scratchy. But most people don't have access to touch 17th century or 18th century Flemish bobbin lace, which is <laughs> totally understandable. I mean, that can't be handled by everyone. But I mean, I had the great privilege of working at the Antonio Ratti Textile Center at the Metropolitan Museum for five years, which is their study and storage facility for textiles, 36,000 textiles from 12, now 13 curatorial departments. So really vast, everything from ancient Egyptian linen to contemporary fiber art, G's bend quilts. It was just a spectacular education. So I got to handle lace all the time. And just the, the gossamer quality and how fine it is, you know, some of these things you can imagine if you were to, not that you would ever do this, but if you were to like drop them from a height, they would barely register. They would just flutter down like a feather. I mean, they're just unbelievable. And yet the technical complexity is just beyond. Like you look at these things and you understand how we got to machines because these are so technically complicated, the structures, just like how weaving led to the binary code system and computers ultimately lace making i feel has heritage in that regard too and as my friend kate secules who's also in my phd program and is a mending historian calls it, it's like textiles are like soft technology they're like the physical embodiment of technology before we got to machines so i can't diss machines because i ha i understand the the continuum but yeah i i would love for there to be more opportunities for people to touch maybe not in museums, but different collections of lace that they can understand that this is something completely different than what you, you, what you find in a store today. So I try, I collect, I have a few things here and there, but even with the lowered prices of antique lace today, it still can be out of my budget. So <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> right. It occurs to me that once upon a time, you probably would have had to level up your skills to be able to use the finest materials. And now you want the materials to make your time worthwhile in a way. Yeah, that's interesting. It's true. 
traditionally, in many cases, lace makers actually had their the lace that they made was out of linen thread. Typically, would be weighed by whoever the merchant or or interloper was that was selling their work to make sure that they couldn't make it for themselves or to sell it directly to sort of prevent any competition with with merchants. And what's interesting about lace is that it's actually the thread itself was not what was valuable about it. It was, you know, the lace makers are imbuing it with that value. So there's this sort of, it's the time spent on it because it could be months or even years that that makes it so valuable. But again, of course, the threads that were incredibly fine and all spun by hand, you weren't just handing those out. You had to work to a certain skill level to be able to not break them and to and to utilize them properly because you would be also graded on your mistakes in terms of pay. So if there were a lot of mistakes in your work and you were selling it by the foot or by the L or by the brachia, depending on where you live, they would really pay you less if, if there are a lot of errors in it. So whereas today, of course, we're not going to spend that much time on something that we that we haven't started with like really the most luxurious materials. And even when we're starting out, we, we use very nice materials in our work typically. And, you know, that's part of the pleasure. If you're going to do it for enjoyment, you might as well enjoy every element of it. So Yeah. And that is the thing that for most lace makers today, this is not a profession and this is not something that we do to sell. There are some who do work in that capacity, which is wonderful. But for the most part, of course, we are hobbyists. And so it really is like a joy and a privilege to be able to choose the materials we want and choose the patterns that we want and then choose to do with our lace, what we want, whether keep it for ourselves or sell it. So it's it's a very different context than we're making that we're making lace in, than historical lace makers. So the way that lace making has become a pursuit of interest, I wonder whether you're seeing that people are generally living and dressing more casually. Is that something that you typically see around you? You mean in the lace world or just in general? Just in general. Yeah, I mean, you know, what's interesting is, and this is something that you'll see, like, it's sort of the stereotype in the fashion design world, where like, the there will be like these genius designers like Alexander McQueen that only wear, you know, like, a white t shirt and jeans, and they, they don't actually dress up themselves. So not only do yes, I mean, I do see, I live in Brooklyn, and I definitely see very stylish people all the time. But I know that that's that people certainly dress more casually now than they than they did historically. And there's many lace makers who don't necessarily wear our lace. It's actually a conversation that we have in the lace world, which is that we should wear it more because then people, people will ask us about it and then we can introduce lace making to them. Give ourselves something to bring up the topic of lace, which we all always want to do. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Part of what I'm sort of sidling toward is that the way that you dress and present yourself is kind of a combination, maybe just like lace, of a of some historic elements, of some contemporary elements, of more formal elements, of more sort of cheeky elements. And I think you, your, your personal style is really kind of thoughtful and distinct. And I wonder how that kind of goes, if it does, with your handwork. Yeah, okay. That's a great question. And actually, I had a professor in art school at Concordia University in Montreal way back in the day in like 2004, who said, and this is before blogs, this is before, you know, this is before social media, and who said to me, she was like, Elena, you should really take photos of your outfits every day, because they're part of your work. They're part of your creativity and your expression. And unfortunately, I never did because I didn't have a cell phone with a camera on it. And I didn't have access to a film camera or someone to take my own photo every day. So I didn't document them, which I sort of regret because I think she was really onto something. And I and I definitely feel, like I said at the beginning of our conversation, that that my academic work to me comes from the same place as my creative work as a maker. And so does my personal style. They're for me, they're all they're all coming from a, a the same intersection of like my interests. And they're just being expressed in different different ways. But as far as People often ask, like, well, what do you call your style or something? You know, they want people want to have a subcultural name to identify you, which I totally understand. It's such a human impulse to want to categorize people. And I've I've always struggled with that because really I have been dressing 
in my own way, not that I don't have myriad influences from all kinds of things and trends and all kinds of stuff, but for so long that it never really has fallen in tandem with any one particular thing that I could give an easy answer. But what I do say sometimes is that my style is called Amish in Tokyo, (laughs) which it kind of makes sense. And then actually, because aesthetically, I love like historical and traditional textiles and very this handmade and I wear a lot of even like historical garments incorporated like folksy bonnets and bloomers and things, but with a very like edgy Harajuku fashion twist. And there's a good reason for that, which is that my grandparents were actually Amish and became missionaries to Tokyo, which is where my mother and subsequently I grew up between those two cultures. So I really was stylistically, aesthetically, and culturally shaped in those two spheres. And I think a lot of my interest in handmade and lace and textiles comes directly from that, which is, again, why I feel like all of these things are one and the same for me. Yeah. (laughs) So I'm going to include a link in the show notes to your Instagram, but just to sort of describe, you know, you, you have vividly colored hair, but then also you have a very modern haircut with very short bangs. And so you are somebody who could easily wear lace and have it be part of your general aesthetic. Whereas I'm sitting here in eight-year-old shorts and a life is good t-shirt. And it would look a little funny if I put on a lace collar. You, people would wonder, what am I trying to say? Well, but at the same time, I, I you know, I, I hear people say like, oh, I could never dress like that or I could, I could never do that. And I, and I just say, but you could, but everyone can, you just have to, <laughs> you just have to commit to it. You just, you almost have to go further than you think. So not just the lace collar, but also layering and and lots of things together. So I just like to put everything on it at once. And sometimes my husband, who also he he actually works in fashion, will ask me, but in sportswear, so different genre than me, not into lace so much. <laughs> um, a little bit though. Yeah. But he'll say like, oh, is this too much when he puts something on? And I'll say like, you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> Don't ask me. It will never be too much for me. But yeah, I mean, also... Many lace makers I know love lace aesthetically because they love to make it. And it isn't necessarily, it doesn't have to be something you wear. I mean, frankly, so many of the things I've made, I would be like horrified if something happened to them when I was wearing them out and about in, in New York City. And so I, I don't wear my own lace that much, which I feel bad when people ask me like, oh, did you make that? Did you make this? And the answer is like, no, no, it's in a drawer at home. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I just realized that there's kind of an assumption I make that lace is feminine. You're speaking about how your husband is in fashion and sportswear, and a little voice in the back of my mind that has that little implicit bias was like, oh, of course, that makes sense. He's a man. He he does sportswear, and you're a woman, and you do lace. Do you think of lace as being kind of gendered that way? Well, that is, I'm so glad you brought that up, because historically, lace was not gendered at all. It was a symbol of power it was a sim- symbol of great wealth and it was worn and treasured by royalty and and people of, of any gender. I mean, it, it was really about if you can afford it, show it off. And when that changed was around the, the industrial revolution period and off- after the French revolution, when people sort of rejected the trappings of the old regime and, and started to associate these men's attire in the 18th century and earlier with this sort of frivolous excess. And they wanted to present themselves as serious and of the world and of the outside and keep women in this domestic interior s- sphere, which historically has not always been true. That's sort of like a construction, a particularly Victorian construction, because women have always worked, not just in the home, but outside too, and for money and not just doing domestic work that we should value as real work at home. So men sort of start to identify themselves and distinguish themselves as, quote, serious by wearing like dark colors and wool. And a lot of people point to Beau Brummel as the sort of like pinnacle of this or, or initiator of this. But really, it's just a cultural shift. You can't really pin on any one person. The world was just changing. And so it's interesting to me, even when people speak about, for example, the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who would wear lace as that's as something that she did to feminize her judiciary robes. Well, actually, historically, she's Elizabeth I wore her lace ruffs as large as possible, specifically to exert her power and her status. And that was not a feminine accessory at all. So it's, it's again, it's about how we value and interpret things. And it's always changing. So even though I am very 
feminine in my own aesthetic and lace has a very feminine identity, which is part of what has drawn me to it. I have definitely unpacked that in my own research and thought a lot more about it. And so today in the modern context, I always emphasize that lace is for everyone and it is not a gendered activity. We have people of all genders in our guild. We, there's, I've met lace makers around the world, men, women, children, all ages. So it is much more of an inclusive thing now than once again, perhaps a more inclusive thing except the maker identities have changed too, because it, it was definitely vast majority girls and women as the makers, but the, the consumers were gender neutral. So I'm sure I'm not alone in hearing this and feeling really inspired to learn more about contemporary lace. Where would you suggest that I go to learn more about it? Yes, absolutely. I'm glad you asked. There's many wonderful resources online. The Lace Museum, which is the lacemuseum.org, in California, run by Kim Davis, has excellent online workshops that are accessible from anywhere, from your couch. Then you can take Irish lace classes from Irish lace makers in Ireland. You know, it's just wonderful. So then there is also in the US, the largest North American lace organization is IOLI, or the International Organization of Lace, Inc. So that's internationalorganizationoflace.org. And they have charter chapters all over the country. So there are many groups in different regions of the U.S. And they have a map. So you can find your closest guild and contact them and see when they meet and have classes. Then in the larger world, there's OIDFOT, which is the, basically the based in France, but the International Organization of Lace, but in French, which I will not attempt to pronounce currently. <laughs> I'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> okay, great. And um, they also, they have a big lace congress every other year. Next year will be in Bulgaria and I plan to be there. So it's very there, it's very exciting. And IOLI also has an annual meeting in the US. So I think it's Dallas next year. So those are great resources for finding local lace information. And then of course there is my guild, which I co-founded with Devin Thine and Kaylin Garcia in 2016. So we're eight years old. Wow. We're getting close to double digits. It's very exciting. And we are Brooklyn Lace Guild. So you can find us at brooklynlaceguild.com or at Brooklyn Lace Guild on Instagram. And the most exciting part of that is that we are actually having our very first exhibition of our members' work that is opening in October. That is called Little Lace, the work of Brooklyn Lace Guild. And it's at the Old Stone House in Brooklyn, which is a beautiful historic stone house with a park and a playground and We've had picnics there and events as a lace group, and now we get to exhibit, and we're very excited. So that opens on October 10. We have the opening party in the evening from 6 to 8, so please come. There's also a fiber festival on October 12 from 10 to 5. We'll have, we'll have a booth. We'll have lace cyanotype making. We'll have demonstrations and a try me pillow, and you can see the show. And that will be up, if you're not in New York in October, that will be up until January 11. So please come and see us. We would love to have you. And there will be other programs and events in association with the show that we will announce soon as well. So I'm very excited. That's so cool. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Well, Elena, thank you so much for spending time with me. I'm so excited to go and kind of explore this whole world that I didn't really know anything about. Thank you so much, Anne, for having me. This has been a real treat. Thanks to our sponsors for supporting the podcast. Thank you for listening to the Long Thread Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate the show and leave us a comment on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Thanks again.